Europe, 1519. The Reformation was spreading from Germany. Just 19 years of age, Spain's young monarch King Charles mounted the Habsburg throne and proclaimed himself emperor-elect of the Holy Roman Empire. France now saw itself encircled by Habsburg possessions in Spain, northern Italy, the Netherlands, and Germany. War broke out. In 1521, French troops laid siege to the city of Pamplona. The situation of the city's defenders seemed hopeless. Their Spanish commanders considered surrendering if the French were to guarantee them safe passage. At that moment, a young and ambitious officer entered the scene. Surrendering without a fight was out of the question, he proclaimed. He would rather perish with honor following the code of chivalry. He persuaded the other officers to continue fighting. In the ensuing clashes, he himself was seriously wounded by a cannonball. His name? Inigo de Loyola, Ignatius of Loyola. The founder of one of the most important Catholic orders was portrayed by opponents and admirers alike as a zealous, almost fanatical knight, who with ironclad self-discipline spared no sacrifice. A stern soldier who barely showed emotion, yet galvanized his followers into an elite force. By contrast, Ignatius is seldom counted among the great mystics of the Church, yet he is one of its preeminent figures whose profound spirituality, combined with the revolutionary dynamism of his journey of faith, transformed the lives of countless people. The wounds he suffered during the Battle of Pamplona confined Ignatius to the sickbed. He read romances of chivalry and legends of the saints. He found himself with more time than he cared for to reflect on his previous life. He took pleasure in accounts of the life of Jesus and the saints. With the same resolve that distinguished him as a great soldier, Ignatius, barely recovered, tried to emulate the great founders of religious orders, St. Francis and St. Dominic. Housed in a cave, he entered a life of poverty and rigorous asceticism. Yet a way of life he would later never advise his Jesuit brothers to practice. But then he experienced something that was to change his entire life. He had an illumination, a vision. He kept the exact content of this experience to himself, but he later wrote about it, describing himself in the third person. This experience was so powerful, as if he had become another person and been given another way of understanding than he had before. God illuminated him, and he began to see the things of God with completely different eyes. He began to discover the good and the bad spirits. He began to savor the things of God and to share them with his neighbor. The outcome of this experience was the insight that a person can find God in all things. Ignatius compiled a guide, a method that would help people perceive God and the world around them. He called it the Spiritual Exercises. Ignatius was now of the belief that Christ reveals himself to us. Christ is not a figure from the distant past. He is present here and now and in all things. Furthermore, there is a path that will lead us to him, one that can be actively practiced. Ignatius began studying theology, first in Spain, then in Paris. In Paris, he found a small group of companions who accompanied him on his path with the spiritual exercises. With the aim of traveling together to the Holy Land, his companions took vows of poverty and chastity. Yet before they considered founding a religious order, political uncertainty obstructed their journey to the Holy Land. they decided to entrust their future duties to the decision of the Pope. Ignatius could not have foreseen the dramatic consequences his spirituality would later have. He, the obedient soldier, 
who gladly acquiesced to the will of the Pope, was repeatedly arrested and interrogated by the Inquisition. For some, the idea of encouraging people to form a direct bond with God seemed too dangerous to contemplate. Such an encounter with divinity, wholly unmediated by the authority of the Church, might be acceptable for one or another saint or mystic, but as a general path for everyone? It is hardly surprising that Ignatius did not prescribe a habit for his order. Nor did he dictate times for prayer, as was common in all other religious orders. After all, God can be encountered in all things at all times. The order recognized no authority or leader other than Christ alone, which is why it adopted the name Society of Jesus. Pope Paul III, eager for renewal in the Church, formally approved the community of Ignatius and his companions as a religious order in Rome on September 27, 1540, 20 years after the Battle of Pamplona. When Ignatius died in 1556, the society had already attracted 1,000 members who were pursuing his mission throughout the world. The community that had begun with just a few companions in Paris was about to embark on a mercurial history that would make it the largest order in the Catholic Church. Beyond the history of the order and the Church, Ignatius, with his special form of spirituality and the exercises, bequeathed a legacy that offered all people the means of finding a path to themselves and to God.